Hello, my name is Simon Wilson and I'm very happy to present this lecture on the physical examination in musculoskeletal medicine. Why the musculoskeletal examination? Well, after we've taken a history from our patient, we'd like to confirm the diagnosis. We'd like to refine the differential diagnosis if necessary and obviously establish a baseline for therapy. To touch the pain, this is absolutely important as making contact with the patient is all about touching the pain. Now, a well-performed physical examination will give 100% relevant information, and the findings on the physical examination should refine and confirm the diagnosis, should instill faith, and should enhance the report with the patient. We use a model called the ARTN model, and I'd like to explain the rationale for this model now. First of all, A, we're referring to appearance or asymmetry. In other words, does the right side equal the left side? And if not, what are the differences and are they important? R is the range of motion. T would be the texture, the tenderness or the touch. And N will refer to the neurological findings which will complement our examination. So, let's go on to A. In A, we're referring to appearance or to asymmetry. Now look at these two pictures. You can see here the young man on the left-hand side and the more elderly man on the right-hand side, both have mildly asymmetrical pictures. For example, the man on the right-hand side, you can see that his neck is t uh, tilted slightly to the right-hand side. His left-hand shoulder is slightly higher. And we can see that the alignment of his scapula are not exactly equal. Is this important? Is this relevant? Well, obviously, this would be based on his history and on other clinical findings. And the same can be said for the young man on the left-hand side. You can see here that at the area of his midriff, of his waist, the uh, area on the right-hand side is slightly, slightly higher than on the left. In fact, the pelvic line is slightly higher on the right-hand side than on the left. Does he suffer from pain? Is this pain relevant to these findings? Well, obviously, this is part of the art of matching the physical examination to the history. Let's look at another example of asymmetry. Here we see a man sitting down. His right leg is mildly extended and the left one is bent. He has difficulty in extending his left knee. And in fact, when we have a look and see when he stands up, you can see that most of his weight is on his right leg. His left leg, mildly bent or uh, partially extended on the left-hand side. What is the clinical significance of these findings? First of all, it's important to note them, and it's also important to, uh, to document exactly the, the findings that you find. For afterwards, if we treat this patient, we'll be able to go back and see what was it beforehand and what is it now. Secondly, this might be very relevant to his findings and might be re very relevant to his uh, history. Range of motion is important. And again, we should document very carefully bending, extension, flexion, and so on. Look at this young man, again, the same one as we see in the previous picture, with his lateral bend to the right-hand side and his extension. Uh, extension, obviously, anything we can compare it to would be flexion, but we can compare the extension to, say, at a later date lateral bending to the right-hand side, to the left-hand side. These are things that could obviously be very different from one side to the next and would be very important. Range of motion is uh, very important also when you're discussing uh, differences on the right and on the left. Now, often we don't really remember the full range of motion, but we can compare each side and see how different they are and what kind of discrepancies we find. And if, say, a patient has got a problem on his right-hand side, we can check the left to see what the normal range of motion would be and see whether the right meets up to that. We can test axial um, uh, range of motion, as you see here in this picture. Tissue texture abnormality. This is very important. When we get to touch the patient, we really want to know what kind of sensitivity or tenderness does the patient have. Is the tenderness in the skin, for example, neuropathic pain? Is it slightly deeper? Would we say the tenderness is subcutaneous? Would it be even further in the fascia? Can we actually feel the fascia or feel the resistance to, uh, to our palpation when we reach the fascia, the muscle, the muscular uh, tendinous junction, and so on? These are very important, and these were taught to us um, and brought to us by various physicians who've been able to explain how we can palpate to different, different levels and reach different conclusions. Now, from Syriax, we can make the adaptation of resisted movement, active movement, and passive movement. 
These are all very important and obviously we're going to find very different findings on the various different kind of movements. If the patient has got full active movement and full range of motion, we'd probably say that everything is quite normal. If on the other hand passive movement is restricted or restricted, resisted movement is restricted, then we're already looking at some kind of pathology and we can go into this in further detail. Um, Sirex then went on to describe what he called the contractile structures and the inert structures. The contractile structures were those which do contract such as muscle, tendons and possibly fascia. And it's very important to realize that if there is a problem with contraction causing pain or limitation, then that, there, we, there we would look for the pathology. If on the other hand the patient has severe pain on complete passive movement, then we would probably look for the inert structures such as the joint capsule, ligaments, fascia and so on. So passive movement examination would be with the patient being very passive and it varies, the, the capsular pattern varies from joint to joint and we would find limitation of movement by a fixed proportion and not to a fixed degree. And here we can see the idea of passive movement. Resisted movement examination, we would try to hold the joint in mid-range, no movement should take place at the joint and we would use an isolated isometric contraction of the muscle in order to test and see um, whether that muscle in fact can move and whether it's painful or painless. The patient would be encouraged to rally all his strength and the examiner would be um, uh, encouraged to take a stance where his balance is uh, superb. Very important to notice, resisted movement interpretation uh, explained to us by Syriax. If the resistant movement is strong and painless, we're probably talking about a completely normal act action. If it's strong and painful, pro I'm Resisted movement interpretation, as explained by Syriax, is, is thus. If the movement is strong and painless, we're probably talking about something which is completely normal. If, on the other hand, it's strong and painful, we're probably talking about a minor lesion in the muscle, tendon, or in the attachment of the tendon to the bone, the enthesis. Weak and painless, rupture of the muscle, or complete neurological dysfunction. And if it's weak and painful, then possibly we're talking about serious pathology that should be ruled out. Pain on repetition would remind us of intermittent claudication and pain on all movements, either we're talking about serious pathology or we should entertain the idea that we're referring to something which probably isn't physical at all. So the neurological in screen would move on and we would examine also the segmental innovation and when we're talking about segmental innovation, we're talking about both the motor and the sensory, probably the reflex and also the autonomic nervous system and how they all work together. So we would do a neurological screen such as the screen that you can see here for the lower limbs and you can see, for example, hip, hip flexion which would uh, be a manifestation of movement of the psoas muscle would probably give us an idea of the L2, L3 segment, knee extension, the quadriceps, L2, 3, 4 segment and so on. I'm not going to go over it all and you can find these pictures quite easily anywhere in an anatomy textbook or on the web. We can continue down with the neurological screen and go down to the foot and look at the inversion, eversion, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And when we look at all these we can be, we begin to understand whether there seems to be some segmental dysfunction possibly in the levels of L4-5, L5-S1 and so on. These kind of tables, as you see here in the next slide, are very, um, are very well known. You have the disc level, location of pain that you would expect, and also the kind of motor deficit that you would see. Often uh, to these tables are also added the kind of reflex that you would see, for example, the patellar reflex or the Achilles reflex, which either would be present or wouldn't be, depending on the level of pathology. So, the ARTN model for examination and documentation is the model that we use, we teach, and we prescribe. It's simple, easy to learn, and quite easy to remember. It's important to look at inert versus contractile tissues as sources of pain in the joints. And it's all about getting in touch with the patient. When you touch the patient, and you touch the pain, you get in touch with your patient. So, I'd like to thank you for your time. We hope this lecture was meaningful you, for you. And to continue to the next lecture, please answer a short quiz as shown in our webpage. And the full course, of course, is free of charge. Thank you. Mm -hmm.